way back at the beginning, um, we started talking about gates and number systems. And by now you should have this idea, obviously, that we've been using all binaries, or so all ones and zeros. Um, ones and zeros and binary is part of this digital number system. Digital simply meaning there's a finite number of options for the numbers. So if you're counting um, on your hands, for example, you can count from one or I guess zero to ten, and that's it. Um, there's no in between. You can't count 2.5 on your fingers. So that's the idea of digital. As I said, binary specifically we'll be using, which has zeros and ones. Um, we'll consider all of these sort of the same when we talk about zeros, the off state, false, zero, and low. Um, when we talk about the on state, you'll often see it referenced as true or high or one. In time, just like an analog waveform, um, we can have the value varying with time. So initially, this is zero, I mean one goes to zero, then one, one. Um, what uses binary is gates, which we've talked a lot about in this course, and you've seen some different ways to use them. Gates just have inputs and outputs, um, and you consider there's some magic that happens to the inputs to generate the outputs. Uh, this magic is defined by a truth table, which simply says, for example, if input 1 is 0 and input 2 is 0, the output's 0. Um, or if input 1 is 0 and input 2 is 1, the output's 1. So there's this table that simply tells you for any specific input, there's a known output. Um, and that's a gate. So the OR gate is 1 when either of the inputs are 1. And you can see... This is how we might build an OR gate. Um, when we have these representations, you'll be shown them in a schematic symbol. So that is how we will draw, draw these connections out. Um, you can see them in a truth table, as I mentioned. You can see them in the formula here, so this plus is meaning the output y is a or b, is how we read that. Um, or we have them in time, so input a is 0, input b is 0, input y is 0, which is this line. And as we move down the table, for example, b goes to 1 here, and this is this line, so it's then 0, b is 1, this is 1. Um, we showed similar examples for other gates and gate, where the input is 1, only when both inputs are 1. The NOT gate, the input is just the opposite of the output. Um, and we can connect all those together to form schematics. So for example, I have a schematic here showing you that I want to figure out what the final output Y will be for every input. And to do this, we just go through. So for example, if A is 0 and B is 0, um, we use the AND gate here, we use this truth table to figure out this output is 0, um, 0 goes there, this 0 goes through the NOT gate, turns to 1, and we use that proper line of the OR gate, so 1 and 0, to get you the final output, 1. Um, and you can go through this for every possible input to figure out what the outputs will be. Um, in the same way we show we can use Boolean functions in the exact same way as a schematic, so they're sort of different ways of representing the same information. Um, so we said this is an AND gate. This point here is A and B. Um, this point, the NOT gate, we could say is this point, which was A and B, inverted. Um, and the output of the OR gate, we know, for example, here is A and B. Here is a and B not. This is an OR gate. So the output Y is equal to A and B or with A and B complement. So again, the same way when you look at a Boolean function written out like that, um, there's a representative schematic associated with it. These little circles uh, we use to represent complement or not. Um, so for example, if we have an AND gate, this little circle means the output is then inverted. 
uh, you'll find these circles el elsewhere. So, for example, do I have, I don't have that example next? Um, what we also showed is if you had something like this, where I have a circle on the input, this is equivalent to an AND gate um, with an inverter there and an inverter there. So there's little circles that are just a way of representing the, the inputs complemented. Um, that this particular gate we call a NAND gate and not AND gate, which is just an AND gate with a inverter at the output. Um, and you can see the truth table, schematic, etc. Same thing with the NOR gate, we can complement the output, we can get the NOT OR gate. Um, and again, we can see the waveforms in time. So for example, 001 is again representing this first line here. Um, as we move further along in time, we can see at this point the inputs are 0 and 1, and you can see it's this point in time here. With just NAND gates, or just NOR gates, we can actually form all the basic logic operations. Um, so as an example, if you had a OR gate, or you wanted to make an OR gate, and all you have is NAND gates, um, you can sort of look at the truth table and say, I need the output to be zero when both inputs are zero for the OR gate. Um, what I have is this, the outputs are zero when both inputs are one. So what you might suggest is that if you simply complemented both inputs, uh, this will give you an OR gate. So if you do this, it gives you an OR gate. So this is an example of how, with a NAND gate, we're building an OR gate. Um, in reality, we don't have inverters. They say we just have, again, just pure NAND gates. Um, then you have to make inverters with NAND gates tied together like that. So three NAND gates equals one OR gate in this example. Uh, this is interesting because as we've already started to talk about, with programmable logic, you can do stuff like have just a huge array of gates um, and connecting them together in different ways gives you different options. So for example, if we had this array here, when I connect them like this, what I have is an OR gate, um, as I showed you. But I can connect them different ways to get other gates. So the exact same layout, but say if I'm able to switch A to there, B to there, and then invert here, um, I would now have an AND gate. And you, know, you can extend this further to show other gates. So there's the AND gate example. Um, exclusive OR, XOR gate, is one that the output is one only when one of the inputs is one, not both. So we can call this gate a difference gate because the output is high if the output is different. Um, we can implement it with basic gates again. So this is showing one implementation of it with a OR gate, AND gate, and NAND gate. Um, so that's fairly straightforward. The exclusive NOR, XNOR gate, we call, we can sort of see that the output is one when both inputs are the same. Um, it's somewhat of a comparison gate to effectively the opposite of the XOR um, because we can see the output is one as long as both inputs are the same. Otherwise it's zero if the inputs differ. Um, that's the summary of the basic gates. You should probably know by now. And then, or no. Uh, the buffer does nothing, basically. So the input is the same. Uh, where we physically use it is, for example, on the programmable logic boards you're using, there's output buffers. And what it does is um, if, you, if you have, you know, say you have some logic and you're driving some other logic, um, and if this logic is either A, physically far away from the other logic, or B, there's you're driving a lot of logic, so it actually takes a fair amount of current. Um, you know, so you're driving all of these inputs. And it depends on the family, if you need it or not, but you add a buffer, and this can increase the drive, the drive strength. Oh. Yeah, 
um, or you can add a buffer, you know, somewhere else down the line. So this signal degrades the buffer because you have to remember with digital logic, um, it's all about it's all ones or zeros. So I don't have a good. What you have is that you know, in reality, the voltage we've always been drawing it like this. You know, one zero one zero. Um, in reality, when you're driving a long line or you're driving current, you'll end up with something. You know, it might sort of go like that because there's some fall time, and it won't go all the way to the high voltage. Um, and there's just some threshold point that you say, you know, if it's here, it's one. If it's here, it's zero. And there's a little bit of room in between that they call the forbidden zone um, that's just invalid. So if you're driving a really long line, the first gate might see valid logic levels. But as you get further away, um, it'll start to degrade. So all you do is just, you put a buffer in. The buffer will just look at this and say, okay, this is a one now, and it'll drive it. You know, the output of this will now be not perfect, but it'll be a lot better because it's recreating it. And then you drive a little further, you might need another buffer. Um, so, you know, stuff like that. Like if you're, there's long runs of cables, that's frequently what you might have at some point. Um, and as I mentioned, we can use NAND or NOR gates to build everything up. Oh, yeah, and the second part we then talked about was physically how we build these gates. Um, I've shown some switches as an example implementation, so switched OR gate, switched AND gate, um, and a switched NOT gate. So, for example, with the NOT gate, we have the inverter because if the switch is open, um, power is going to flow through this resistor to the output, and it'll drive it high. If the switch is closed, it's going to drive that output to ground. It shorts it to ground, um, and not enough current flows through this to make the output hot. So it's basically zero volts. Um, in reality, we don't have you know switches with gnomes or something inside there. What we have is electronic switches. Um, we use field effect transistors FETs here. Um, and this is sort of the type of diagrams you'll see throughout everything. Uh, so with a FET, we have this thing where if the input is high, um, the switch is closed. So we have one, zero. So when the input's high, the switch is closed. When it's low, the switch is open. Um, so what this means is when this is high, it drives this FET closes. So you can see it's just like the switch closing, um, and it works the same way. We don't actually have use that resistor scheme. Instead, because we have electronic switches, what we do is we have two FETs, two electric switches. Um, and you'll notice that there's this dot. Again, remember, remember the dot means invert. Um, so this top switch, um, when the input's high, is open. The bottom one, when the input's high, is closed. So if you have a one here, um, this switch is closed, basically, and this one is open. So you can see what you're doing is you're connecting it to ground, what they're calling VSS. Um, in the same way, if this is zero, zero here, 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 this top switch, because it's an invert, is now closed, and this bottom one is open. Um, and again, the zero becomes a one at the output now, because we're connecting it to the positive rail. Um, we call FET logic, uh, we call this complementary metal octopide semiconductor that we'll use, um, because I might have switched these, by the way, don't trust that. Uh, it's using PMOS and NMOS, so there's a positive and a negative. It's complementary because um, basically one is the complement of the other, is where the name comes from. So you can see one is closed when um, the input's high, one is closed when the input's low. So we can build up more complicated gates. Here's a NAND gate, for example. Um, 
And again, you can sort of go through, I don't think I do that, you can go through and see how this functions. So you can say, well, if the input's 0, 0, um, both of these will be open. Um, so this is disconnected from here. Both of these switches will be closed, so the output becomes 1. So you can say 0, 0, 1. Um, in the same way, you can basically see that if either of these is 0, what's going to happen? Because these two are in parallel, um, one of these switches will be closed, resulting in the output is going to be high. So as long as one of these is 0, the output's high. Finally, when both of these are 1, um, we can see that these two switches will be disconnected. These two switches will be disconnected. Um, so you can say it's open. And both these switches will be closed, so it's finally driving the output to zero. Um, so you can look back at the truth table and see, well, this functions as a NAND gate. Um, there may be. I mean, it's covered. So it would be nothing more complicated than this or the nor or the not. So it's not going to be a gigantic thing. But yeah, I mean, you, you should know basically that what the circle means, that it's closed or that's open. Um, because that may... The implementation questions may very well be there. Um, and again, same thing for the NOR. So all you really have to do is go through, you know, if it's zero, if you're asked to say, what is this? Um, yeah, and you, you wouldn't have to memorize, for example. It won't be design and NAND. It would be the other way around. Okay. So yeah, there's no point in memorizing. You just look that up. But you, you should understand what the symbols mean, basically. Um, so if it's 0, 0, you can go through and say, well, 0, 0 means these two are closed. Again, we have the complement, so you have to remember this closes it, so the output's going to be 1. Um, likewise, you can see that because these two are in parallel, as long as one of those is high, it's going to drive the output low. And in fact, if both of them are high too, it's going to drive the output low. So you can write out the truth table. Um, and again, we can go back and say, what type of circuit is this? Well, this is a NOR. Um, so that would be the implementation of the NOR gate. There is a number of families. As I told you, this was CMOS I'm showing you using these field effect transistors. Um, in the lab, at the beginning of the class, we used a tiny bit of TTL, transistor-transistor logic. Um, what all these different families mean is basically it's different ways of implementing the logic gates. Um, and the different families vary based on a few characteristics. And obviously, for example, the amount of power they consume will vary. Um, so something like CMOS, which is what's most commonly used right now, is quite good with power consumption. Um, and that's because a lot of stuff we're doing, you know, cell phones and Laptop computers, power consumption is very important to have low power consumption. Um, TTL is an older technology, and it was worse with power consumption, which is one of the reasons CMOS became more popular. Um, we do have other characteristics, for example, speed. So typically, technologies that are capable of running a lot faster are worse for power. There's always engineering trade-offs we are making. Or, for example, physically, the chips may have to be bigger. The, the technology requires uh, larger geometries. So there's a different and a whole number of trade-offs you can be making here. Um, next, we talked about number systems. Um, so with number systems is just the conversion of numbers into different bases. What we always deal with is decimal or base 10. Um, what we'll be using a lot of is binary, which is base 2. So to convert the two, um, what we'll do is we'll think about how numbers work in base 10, which is to say if you had a number like you know, 
129. Um, each digit has some value. So you can think of the 9. Um, you may consider it having just a value of 9. When you think of the 2 in this, it says if it has a value of 20. Um, and when you think of the 1, it says if it's 100. When you, you'd say the number, you would say 129. So you're actually going through each one and saying that out. Um, where this comes from is that, oh, to do that. Where that comes from is that if we have, you know, 129 again, this is actually 9 times 10 to the power of 0. This is actually 2 times 10 to the power of 1. Because it's base 10, this is where the 10 is coming from. So you can see that the 0, 1, 2 is just the position of that digit. Um, it'll be the same thing for binary, except the position of each digit goes up by a power of 2. So this digit is worth um, 1 to the power of 0. This digit is worth 2, you can see, 2 to the power of 1. 2 to the power of 2 is 4, 2 to the power of 3 is 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. Um, and in the same way as with decimal, if you just add up all those amounts, um, you'll get the decimal number. So, for example, we have a 1 here in this digit that's worth 128. So we add that in. We add the 64 in. We add the 32 in. We don't add where there's a 0. Um, say there's sort of nothing there. Again, we add here. There's an 8. 2, and 1. So when you add all those up, you'll get decimal 235. Um, for binary to decimal, you can basically do the reverse of that, um, which is to start at the uppermost digit and say where, basically how can I convert this to decimal? So for example, if you start with 216, um, if you have 216 in decimal, you can start with the next largest number. Um, 256 is too big. We don't use that. So 128 um, is the largest number that's not larger than the number we're trying to convert. Um, because as I said, the next one would be 256, which is no use. So you can say 216 minus 128. 8 um, is greater than 0, we get 88, so we put a 1 here. The next position is worth 64, so 88 minus 64 um, is greater than 1, so we put a 1 there. And we get 24. We move to the 24. Um, this next position is worth 32. 32 is no good to us because it's larger than 24. We can't make 24 with 32, so we put a 0 there. Um, we try again. We have 16 here, so 24 minus 16. We can use 16. We put a 1 there. Um, finally, we try the 8. We have 8. 8 minus 8 gives us 0, so we can use 8. So you can see this procedure is just the reverse of the other way of converting, and you're just thinking about um, how can I make this number with the given positions. Remember when you're done, you may need to add some extra zeros. Those zeros are um, in the lower values, you need to put them there because otherwise you have no way of knowing sort of what position these should be in. So for example, 11011 um, is not 216. You need those 000. zero, zero. And zeros in front don't matter. You can drop them. Doesn't matter if they're there or not. Um, we'll use this notation when defining numbers, binary or decimal. Um, we'll use a little 10, for example, to mean a decimal number, so that's 2 in decimal. We'll use 2 or maybe a B for binary. Um, so all of these are equivalent. Um, you check your conversions with Windows Calculator if you're doing some practice, or um, Standalone calculators, a lot of them have a binary or hex conversion.
Um, other number systems we'll use, hexadecimal goes up to 16 per digit. Um, so with hex, you can see we use 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then it goes A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, so what this means is, for example, that 1, 0 uh, in hex isn't 10. What this is meaning is, in this position, this is actually worth 16. Um, and in this position, we have a 0, so 1, 0 hex would actually be 16 decimal. Um, or you can have stuff like 1F, for example, because this is uh, 16 plus 15, because the F is worth 15. This little sheet here has a conversion between um, decimal and hexadecimal. There's also the octal number system, which goes from one uh, from 0 to 7, so there's eight possible values for each digit. Hexadecimal and octal are really handy um, for converting directly from, from and to binary. So, for example, if I have this 24-bit binary number and I want to tell it to someone, um, you know, you're not going to tell them, oh, it's 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, et cetera, right? That's crazy. Um, you could do the decimal conversion, so you could say, okay, well, the number is 1, 1, 0, 6, 7, um, 3, 1, 4. The problem is the conversion is more complicated. Obviously, more complicated means error prone, and it's just more work. So with hex, four bits directly correspond to one digit. So if you're given a hex number, um, you can just go through and write down what is the equivalent in decimal in binary. Or if you're given a binary number, you can directly say this is the equivalent in hex. So for example, um, these four are equivalent to two. These four are equivalent to B. And again, you can use this. So one zero one one is equivalent to B. Yeah. So this is on the that cheat sheet that's posted. Um, same thing for octal except you're just converting three bits at a time. Octals, again, it's very easy to convert back and forth between binary and this octal notation. Um, hex is now far more popular. You won't run into octal very much, to be honest. Um, BCD, or binary coded decimal, we used a bit in the lab, and you saw the advantage of it was in binary coded decimal, if you have a number, say 234, all you do is you convert each digit into the equivalent um, binary number. So 4 is 0, 1, 0, 0. 3 is 0, 0, 1, 1. 2 is 0, 0, 1, 0. Um, the disadvantage of BCD is it's very wasteful because we're actually not even using, um, you know, we could we can only encode up to nine in this number, which is one zero zero one. So if you know one twenty nine, um, so we're actually not even using any of the higher possibilities for this these bits. That's as high as we're going to go. Um, so it is more wasteful, but easier for communicating decimal numbers, especially if you're a display in a system. Um, adding in binary is very similar to how we add with regular decimal numbers. So, you know, if you have 27 plus 13, you would go 7, 8, 9, 10, so 0, carry the 1, um, 40. With binary, what we do um, in the same way, you know, we have 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, say. Um, to add in binary, all you do is we go 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1, again, we can't have 2. We only have 1 and 0 as a possibility. So 1 plus 1 gives us 0 with a carry of 1. Um, 1 plus 1 plus 1, which would give us binary, th or would give us 3, again, we can't have that, would give us 1 with a carry of 1. Um, and I sort of wrote these not underlined. So then we'd have 0 plus 0 plus the carry of 1, give us 1, and finally 1 plus 0 gives 1. Um, so you can see that it's very, very similar to how we add 
with decimal numbers. Um, subtracting in binary, again, same sort of idea. Say if I have you know 13 minus oh, 4. Um, actually, I'll say 23. 23 minus 4. So to do 23 minus 4, what we would do is we would say, okay, this isn't good. We'll just carry um, or borrow, I mean, sorry. So we borrow from the higher column. You have to remember we're borrowing a 10 effectively from this column, so now this becomes 13. So then you can do 13 minus 4, give you the answer, and then 1 minus 0 to give you the answer. Um, in binary, you know, say if I have this, um, minus what do I want? Make it easy. Um, again, so we have 0 minus 1 requires a borrow. Um, to do a borrow, in the same way we borrow from the next highest, so I borrow from here. You have to remember what this is. This isn't, you know, 10. It's binary, so we borrowed a 2, effectively. So this now becomes, um, yep, 1, 0, so it's equivalent to 2 minus 1, um, which would give you 1. So you have to put a 1 there. And then you can just go through. So then we have 0 minus 0 is 0, 1 minus 0 is 1. Um, so that's the procedure for subtracting in binary. Again, very similar to how we subtract in decimal. For positive and negative numbers, um, we have different ways of representing them. So I don't have that there. If we have this number wheel, for example, if I have all possible numbers, we might say, okay, well, this is 0, 1, 2, 3. So these are the straight binary conversions. Um, I then might say that what I'll do is use the highest bit here to indicate a negative number. So negative 0, negative 1, negative 2. Again, this is just the sign bit. Negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 7. Um, and this type of notation, although it seems pretty straightforward, it has issues. For one thing, there's two zeros, you can see, so there's negative and positive zero. Um, and it also, you can't just add numbers straight together, like, as they're written, because, for example, if you add negative five to plus one, um, you get negative six, which is crazy, that's not right. Same way, you know, if I add negative 3 and negative 2, I get positive 5, not negative 5. So you need some additional logic to deal with all these um, different processing, so to deal with the negative number and the positive numbers being added or subtracted. Um, so this is bad because it's just annoying. It's a lot of work. You need more stuff to do it. So what we'll use instead is we'll use this idea um, that we to we'll use this idea that if we want to subtract two numbers we can just add a negative version of it we saw with this it didn't work like you know if I added negative 5 and positive 1 that did not give us the expected minus 4 but if we use different number systems um, we actually can take advantage of that so the number systems we'll use is complementary number systems. Um, complementary number systems are basically a way of adding without, or subtracting, I mean, sorry, um, subtracting through adding. So with complementary number systems, they sort of came about because, you know, if you have, if you're doing a lot of math and it requires a lot of boros, it's, more prone to errors. Um, people are typically better at adding and carrying. It just is seen as more straightforward. Um, and I'll go straight to the binary example. Um, with complementary number systems, we basically uh, use it to represent negative numbers. Um, so if we want to take a complement of a number, we can, there's sort of two ways to do it. I think I go through, which way do I go through first? Um, so the first way is to 
create the ones complement and then add one to it. Take a second. So the first way is to create the ones complement. You create the ones complement by just inverting the whole thing. Um, and then you just add one to it using your normal binary addition. Um, so, you can create the twos complement of a number by inverting it. So, just one, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, zero, zero. Um, and then you just add one. So, in this case, we would get a zero with a carry, zero, carry, then one, 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 zero, one. Um, so this would be the two's complement of that number. And that's the instructions there. The second way to do it is to actually, um, you write down each number until you get to the first one. So I have a zero, I have a zero. My first one, I continue to write, and then I just invert the rest of the bits. Um, it's up to you which method you use. The results will be the same, as you can see here. Um, what would be given a two complement uh, binary number, say, converted to normal decimal? Yep, you may be given that. So to give you an example, um, erase this. You know, say you were given, you may be given a number like this and say, what does this represent? Assuming this is a two's complement number, what does it represent in decimal. Um, so if it's a signed two's complement number, that's to say it can represent a negative, um, how you might do it is using either method. I'll use the invert and add because I feel like it's um, harder to screw up. So you do that. We'll add one. Um, And then you convert this number to decimal. So we convert this number to decimal. Um, so we can say, for example, this is worth 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. Um, so you'd say, okay, this number is worth 128 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4. Um, so I don't know what that actually equals. Pardon? 119. 190. 190, okay. Um, pardon? Okay, 191. Uh, so it's 191. Again, remember, if this was a sign two's complement number, because it's in two's complement notation, it's negative. Um, so the final answer will be negative 191. So... If it says sign two's complement, make sure you have the negative because otherwise it's incorrect. The two's complement, we're always, in this course, we're always going to be using for a negative number only. Then if it didn't mean one one? Um, this part you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so the negative, for, for real two's complement number, and this one I just told you it is, what it is is the highermost bit um, tells you. So if the highermost bit is one, the number is in two's complement format and thus negative. If it's zero? If it's zero, then it's just straight binary. Um, so if that was zero, you wouldn't do this conversion. Um, and when we talk about, you know, if it, what bit is zero or one, we use the notation of the most significant bit, MSB. Um, most significant, meaning that it has the highest value. So in this case, the value of 128. The least significant bit has the lowest value, so the value of 1 in this example. Um, 
And that's that's the procedure for the second way of doing it. We'll go through all the examples. Um, so when we have a number wheel, so this is showing you, say this is a 4-bit signed twos complement. Um, so I tell you, there's four bits in the number, I tell you it's signed, and it's using the twos complement form. So that means that when it's zero, um, the signed bit is zero, meaning it's positive, which then means we do not use twos complement. So we just directly convert the remaining three bits. So this becomes zero, this becomes one, game zero, this becomes two, this becomes three, this becomes four, this becomes five, six, zero, seven. So now this bit is one. Um, so this means we need to convert the number. So one, zero, zero, for example. Again, one is telling you that it's in two's complement format. Um, and we use, for example, if you convert to one, 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 zero, um, and then add one. We get zero, 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 and then one. And then we, what we're doing is we're ignoring um, the higher bit here. So then, wait, that didn't work. Oh wait, no, sorry, I lied. Um, yeah, we're ignoring we're ignoring a, a higher bit if it was if there's anything above that. So we're just taking those four bits. So those four bits, this is equivalent to eight. And again, it's a negative, so then we have negative eight. Um, if we have one zero zero one, again, say if we convert zero one one zero, um, add one, and we get zero one one one. This is seven, so it's negative seven. Um, for this one, for example, one zero one zero. Again, we say this is in two's complement. Um, thus, it's a negative number. To get the equivalent decimal value, uh, one one. So then you can see it's six or negative six, and it works out the same way: negative five. Three, negative one. Um, so this is the sine two's complement number wheel. It's showing you that we can represent from zero to seven, as well as from negative eight to negative one. Um, so one artifact of this system is that your range of negative numbers will always be one more than the range of positive numbers. Um, and you'll see this in computers if you're using, for example, a 16-bit sine integer. Um, the maximum positive value it can hold is smaller than the maximum negative value in absolute terms. All right. Next slide. Um. So the next thing we talked a bit about is Boolean algebra. So Boolean algebra is how we deal with um, all of those Boolean logic functions. We already saw a little bit, for example, that we could convert from you know an AND gate schematic. We could say, if we had this, we could say f is equal to a and b. And we can make more complicated ones. So the advantage of Boolean algebra is that you can take those and manipulate them without, you know, redrawing the schematic 50 times. Um, and we'll use a whole bunch of different identities to simplify these equations and simplify the circuits, in fact. So some of them are somewhat obvious. So for example, if you have, um, if you have an OR gate, you can think about the fact that if I have A and the output Y, if this output is zero, um, the output Y is going to be the same as A. If this input is one, the output's just always going to be one. 
um, because of how the OR gate functions. In the same way with the AND gate, you can have similar operations that an AND with zero is always going to be zero, or an AND with one is always going to end up with the same as the input. Um, these two operations, we actually later use these, and you can see for if you want to have an enable line, um, we can have some data. Enable and out. Um, if this enable line is zero, the output's always zero. If the enable line is one, the output's always the same as the data. So that's one example of how we could use those operations. Additional rules telling you that if you connect the input of a gate together, the output for both OR and for AND gates, um, the output's just the same. That's telling you this. We had complementary rules, which is to say if we complement one input to a gate, what happens? So with OR gates, um, if you complement one input, for example, one of those is always going to be one now, meaning the output will always be one. With an AND gate, we read that the opposite, and we say one of these will always be zero, which for the AND gate means the output would always be zero. Involution is simply if we have chains of even number of gates of inverters, um, we can see a complement and then double knots. So we have a double negative, the output is just the same as the input. Um, if it's an odd number, then obviously what we end up with is you know, a complement, 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 which is the same thing as just a single complement. Um, commutative tells us that it doesn't matter the order of operation, or not the order of operation, the order that it comes in within a single gate. So if we have an OR gate, it doesn't matter where we connect B or A. It's the same regardless of if we connect A to the top one or B to the top one. Um, also, when we have several um, terms like this, it doesn't matter how we associate them together. So what this means is that if I have ABC that I'm anding together, it doesn't matter if I do this. It doesn't matter if I instead do something like, um, what's the other one? A here. A and B, oops. No, or if you do B and C first, and then or in A. Um, or what we might draw is we might actually have a three input AND gate. And those are all equivalent. It doesn't matter what order it happens in. Um, the distributive rules, this is one where it starts to differ a tiny bit from what you might intuitively think from just you know years of algebra. Um, the distributive rules operate on both the OR and AND in a similar way. Um, so this differs, obviously, from algebra. We don't operate them on multiplication and addition in the same way. So the first example here shows us that if we have A anded with B or C, um, it's equivalent to A anded with B or with A anded with C. So you can see how um, this A has distributed itself here and here. Um, in the same way, though, it, you can do that with the OR. So if we have A OR, B e and C, um, you can distribute this A AND in the same way we distribute, or the A OR in the same way we distribute the A AND. So again, this distributes here, distributes here, A and B, or A OR B, A OR C and then both are anded together. Um, within order of operation, again, somewhat similar to everything you've done before, um, we'll always apply this not first, um, then we'll apply the and before finally applying the or. So this would be equivalent to writing 
A and B complement or C. Um, so it's telling you that the the and is applied before the or in this case, um, or in all cases you'll see. I'll try to use brackets typically in any problems I give you just to be absolutely clear. Um, absorption rules are some that we'll get into as well as simplification rules that end up um, providing you with easy ways to simplify some various problems. Uh, consensus, again, some of these, those are just, you have to look for a specific pattern and apply it. D. Morgan's is one of the more powerful ones, and this is telling us how to convert um, between NOR and NAND gates effectively. So we can see here what we have are OR gates, and here we've ended up with the AND gate. Similarly, here we have a NAND gate, um, and here we've ended up with OR gates with the inputs complemented. So when we use D. Morgan's, this is a really good way to, if we want to bring everything to NAND or everything to NOR gates, um, this is where we'll use that. Again, these are some additional simplification rules that if you look for specific patterns, you'll be able to apply these. When you're proving stuff uh, with binary, one option we don't have, or with Boolean, I mean, not binary, we don't have compared to regular algebra is that we can actually prove stuff by just testing every case. You can't do that, you know, with a variable. Um, you can only test a few cases. We call this perfect induction because we're testing every possibility. So if I want to prove that these two are the same, um, there's only four possibilities for the inputs, and that's it. Likewise, I can test all four possibilities for this side, and you can see that they end up being the same. And that proves it by perfect induction, so it, it is proved. Um, alternatively, we can, of course, go through um, and use all of these identities to prove it. So as an example, we can derive some identities. Um, so here I'm deriving, which number is this? This one, 16. So one of the absorption rules. Um, oops. And it's showing you to do this. What we do is we first expand it. So we bring this A or into each one, um, which is number 15. And again, this is showing you each possible each step in the process. Um, we're then going to use rule three. Um, I think originally in the videos online, I go through this in more detail. I don't want to go through it in a ton of detail because it takes so long. Um, in the same way, we'll use that to simplify circuit. So if you're given a circuit to simplify, you can convert it to a Boolean function and then just apply the various rules as you go down. Um, there's no necessarily perfect way to do it because depending on what steps you take, it may be simpler or uh, more complicated as you go through it. So you may be able to skip a few steps. Next thing we talked about is when we're given a logic circuit, I had said briefly here that um, you know we're going to end up with a simplified form uh, from the original form, but different people may come up with different methods of writing out that simplified form, different simplified forms. Um, so we have instead what we call canonical forms, um, which are a standard form that everyone will come up with the exact same one. So if I say, what is the canonical form of this? Um, everyone needs to come up with the same one. And how we create those canonical forms is we use either what's called min terms or max terms. Um, so min terms are how we generate each one output. So this, so for example, to get that one output using and, um, we have A is zero, so A we complement, B is one, C is one, A and B and C. A complement B and C. Sorry. Um, to get this one, A is one, B is zero, C is zero. So these are the min terms. So again, all we're doing 
is we're going through and generating these ones. Um, so everywhere there's a zero in the input, we just complement that input variable. Um, the final canonical form will be the sum of all of these products. So you can see it's very straightforward. It's basically just writing out what the truth table as we've been given it. So then we can say f is equal to a complement and b and c, or with a and b complement and c complement, with a and b complement and c, or with a and b and c complement, or with a and b and c. Um, So this is, is the standard form that everyone would come up with the same one. Um, so what I showed you was using the min terms. Um, you can see the min terms are the and. So we're anding together all the various input variables. Uh, so we call this form using the min terms the sum of products form. Sum of products because it's oring together, summing all of the different product terms. Um, we can also use max terms, which is product of sum term. In max terms, uh, you can see what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to create zeros instead of creating ones, because the form will be, um, erase all this, A and B and C, for example, because when A is 0 and B is 0 and C is 0, the output is 0. Um, A and B and C complement, A and B complement and C. Because, for example, if A is 0, B is 1, we complement it to get 0, and C is 0, the output is 0. Um, then we can say the output is this product of sum, so we and together all of these. So you can see what this is doing is actually generating um, generating the zeros in the output. So only for one specific these specific combinations will this output be equal to zero. Everywhere else it's going to be one because of the form of this. Um, so again, sum of products uses the ones. And we use min terms to generate that. We'll have a, a slightly simplified version, you can see at the bottom, where I've just said, because the min terms are standardized, I can just say, okay, min term 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, which is the same thing as saying there's ones at that location. You know, there's one when the input is equivalent to binary 3, binary 4, binary 5, 6, and 7. Um, we even have a more compact representation you'll see where I just use the summation of min term 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Again, this is just saying here's the location of the ones on the truth table. Um, you can take that form and then simplify it down. So this is one example of that previous function and we simplify it down to a easier simplified version. Um, product of sum, again, we're generating zeros. It might be more convenient to use product of sum. Um, in this case, for example, there's only three zeros compared to the five ones. Um, so when we use product of sums, we have, in this case, we have a smaller um, canonical form because there's only the three of them. And again, so there's, compared to when we had sum of products, and we had this. Again, you can simplify it, and it should give you the exact same result, which here you can see it does give you the same result. Um, so in this case, the simplified version is the same, which it should be. Um, we'll have this idea of how many levels of combinational logic we have. Um, a lot of the stuff we'll be dealing with is going to be two-level combinational logic. So by two level, what we mean is if we have these inputs, you know, A, B, and typically you assume that complements are available. So, you know, here we have C complement and D. Um, 
So what you can see is we generate some intermediate values here, which is level one. So this is A and B, and here we have C complement and D. Those intermediate values then get ORed to give us the output. So then this becomes level two. So that's two level combinational logic. Um, so for example, we could have three level combinational logic if you had something like that. Um, and then, you know, this A goes here. So this would now be three level combinational logic because we now generate another intermediate value and then we're doing something else. So what I've shown here would then be like this and A. Um, often you can break this down. So for example, we could move this A, we could distribute it to get back to two level combinational logic, um, which is what we'll also talk about later when we're doing dealing with hazards and stuff. We'll always want to get to the two level form. Um, so when we were talking about adding, I showed you the example, you know, we have an input, we have some outputs. The most basic form of this adding is the half adder where we have this input here and we're just adding, for example, one plus zero gives us zero as well as any additional carry. Um, so carry. In this case, the carry is zero because one plus zero, oh, that gives us one, yeah. Not zero. Gives us one with a carry of zero. Um, so we have this, this truth table for the half adder. Again, this is just the two inputs, A and B. There's no carry input for the half adder. So if we have um, one and one, this is where we get a carry output. So some still zero because there's just the carry. Some is zero in that case, not still zero. Um, the other cases where one of the inputs one, we always have the one output. Um, and if both inputs are zero, there's obviously no sum output. So we can use the min terms we talked about to represent this. So this is A complement, and this is B, um, and this is A and B complement. That's where the ones are in this truth table. So you can see here I have the, out the sum output. You can do the same thing for the carry output. You can say, well, the only one here is at this point when it's A and B, because A is one and B is one. And that's where we get the one output. So there's just the single um, min term here. So carry output is A and B. So this is what the circuit would look like then if we do that. Um, we have A and B input, we have sum and carry. And we can look through if we can improve it using the um, Boolean identities we've talked about. And we can come up with this version of it. So it's slightly simplified. You can see um, there's fewer gates and fewer levels of gates. So before, you notice we had um, with the inverters here, and then we go through an AND gate, and then an OR gate. Whereas now, uh, we don't have the inverters anymore, and we just have those two gates we're going through. Um, it's also worthwhile discussing the fact that here we've actually gone to a NAND gate um, as well, which has some advantages for speed purposes. Um, and that is that when I showed you this implementation earlier, you've noticed that the NAND gate is using four transistors. To create an AND gate, what we actually do is we make a NAND gate and then we invert the output. Um, so, you know, something like that. So this is the inverter we showed before. Um, this additional, these additional levels of gates add some more delay in the circuit, so it will run a bit slower. So there's actually an advantage to having this NAND gate here. 
Um, similarly, before, here we still have AND gates and NOR gates, which are built, uh, OR gates, sorry, which is built the same way, NOR gate plus inverter. Um, but before, we had this additional level of even an extra inverter added in, again, which will have some a little bit slower logic created. So, even easier um, with the half adder, we can realize the sum is act actually just an XOR gate and we can represent it like this. So just an XOR gate and an AND gate. Um, the full adder adds a carry input in addition to the carry output. So, initially the carry input is obviously zero when you think about this. Um, so if we have one zero, sum of one, carry of zero, carry goes here. Zero, we have one, carry of zero, and you can just go through one, carry of zero, not super exciting. Um, and you can see how this carry just propagates through. Um, give you the final output. Um, so that's the full adder is just one of these levels. So the full adder is that. So you can see we can connect a bunch of full adders together to add up however many bits we need. Um, but the important part is we have a carry in, we have A in, B in, sum out, and carry out. So this is what the truth table would look like. Um, again, we have three inputs because we now have that carry input. Uh, the same two outputs. We can do the same design process we've been using, um, where we just talk about with min term. So we say min term one, two, four, and seven. Again, one, two, four, and seven. The location of the ones. Carry out. You can do the same design process. So you can say three, five, six, seven are the ones. Um, Although, the other thing you can realize is that we can build a full adder rather than going through and simplifying these, you know, more complex equations, we can build it from half adder. So, if we have a half adder, which again is this, so we have A in, B in, sum out, carry out, um, we'll create the same truth table if we just do this. So, what this is doing, you can see we have the A and B in, um, so this is adding A and B. It then creates that intermediate sum and adds it to the input carry. Um, so it now adds in that third bit, the carry in, to generate the final sum out. Um, and then if either of those half adders generates a carry, there is a carry out propagated to the final output. Um, if we want n bit adder, so here's a four bit adder. Uh, we can do something like this. So you see we have a, um, a number of full adders connected together. And all we're doing is this process that I've showed. So we generate a carry out, we bring it to the next one. Generate a carry out, bring it to the next one. You keep feeding that through um, to give you the final four bit adders. To do a subtractor, um, you can go through the design process. And in the lab, you actually, I believe, showed that a little bit, that you can, you know, you can, okay, create a full subtractor that has a borrow instead of a carry, and blah, blah, blah. But an easier way to do it is use that signed notation we talked about. Um, as I said, with the signed notation, if you want to, you know, go uh, 13 minus 5, you just make it 13 plus negative 5. So you just need an ability to complement the input. Um, or create the two's complement of the input, not just complement the input. Sorry. So how we do this is um, we can actually set up four full ladders like this. And then we can set up, these are the inputs A, so we have the four A inputs and the four B inputs. B, B, B. And you notice the B inputs feed through an XOR gate um, before going to the full adder. With the XOR gate, if we had, you know, I'll 
call it a CD if we have something like this what you notice at the output of the XOR gate so this little truth table here is going to be the XOR gate truth table which you may not be able to see even um, looks something like this and what you'll notice is that for example if C is 0 um, the output simply follows the input D if C is 1 the output is the inverse um, of the input D so what this means is that we can actually use this mode pin to select whether we complement the input or not so when the mode pin is 1 um, all of the B inputs are going to be inverted. So if, you know, if the input's 0, 1, 0, 1, um, with the mode pin high, what actually goes to B, which we'll call B prime, becomes 1, 0, 1, 0. You know, something like that. Um, so this is the first step in the, the choose conflict procedures. We just invert all the bits. The next step is then we add 1. Um, and how we do that is you'll notice the carry in. Again, when the mode is set to 1, carry in becomes 1, meaning we add 1 to it. Um, so what this is doing is it's actually, when mode is 0, it's just functioning like an adder. When mode is 1, it converts the input to 2's complement and then adds A to it, um, which is doing this right here. So it's acting like a subtractor. Um, so what you can see is this is a way of doing a subtractor using a full adder so the huge advantage of this is that you don't need whole separate circuitry for adder and subtractor you just have you know a 16-bit adder with these XOR gates on in the input and it can become a 16-bit subtractor so it's the same logic and you just decide what you do with it um, this sort of thing is the basic for what we call the arithmetic logic unit, or ALU, and ALU is just a big chunk of logic that can do all sorts of different functions. So this example that I showed you was we had a block that can do addition or subtraction. Real ALUs can do even more than that, so you can do addition, subtraction, maybe multiplication, maybe division, um, depending how complicated they get. You know, you can do complements, you can do... Um, Two's complements, all sorts of stuff like that. So the final thing for today. Um, so the final thing we'll talk about, I'll just get to gray codes. Uh, so gray codes are something we'll use um, later as well when we talk about state machines these get talked about a little bit too where gray codes come about is imagine if I have a design I have a counter um, and I have two logic blocks do something when the counter is zero do something when the counter is three you know like I don't know prime a launch so say we're counting down from ten so it goes ten nine eight seven six five four three at this point, this output you expect to go high, and then low again, um, and then zero. You expect it to go high. At that point, this count is equal to zero, zero, zero. Um, the problem is that there's actually some intermediate values that might cause glitches. So, for example, um, we can look at this point right here. I go from 1, 0, 0 to 0, 1, 1, 1. So I go from 1, 0, 0, 0 to 0, 1, 1, 1. So those are the two steps. In reality, as the counter's counting, um, you know, there's going to be tiny differences in length of wires and devices. And it means that this input, that going from 1 to 0, uh, maybe it goes first. So it transitions to 0 first. Um, before the outputs that are going high have gone high yet. And the problem is that this point right here is actually 0, 0, 0, 0. 
So if we have logic that's reading this 0000, zero, zero, zero it's going to act upon it. Um, and you know, you'll see, so count is equal to 0000. zero, zero, zero. Um, it'll be low, and then it'll go high briefly there, because it is equal to 0000, zero, zero, zero for that brief instant of time. It's unintended, but it's true. So gray codes are counting sequences that um, avoid this problem by only a single bit changes at a time. So for example, you notice um, when, we, when we're here, 0111, the next step isn't 1000, but it's in fact 0101. So what we do is we go from um, you know, zero, one, one, one. So you have to imagine this is high, um, and this is low. And only one bit changes. Oops. Only this bit changes. Ignore that. Um, so what's happened is only one bit changes at a time. So there's no possibility for this intermediate value to exist because it's either that or it's the next thing. Because only one bit has changed at once, it doesn't matter if there's a bit of delay in when it switches. So gray code counting sequences are really good because they don't have that problem. Um, to generate them, what you do is you start with the most basic code sequence you have. Um, even if it's just a one-bit gray code. So, for example, one bit means it's zero, and then it's one. That's it. Um, we draw a line, and we mirror it to so one zero. Um, to the top part, we add zeros. To the bottom part, we add ones. And then you repeat that. So this is now our two-bit gray code sequence. So you can see we have drawn this two-bit gray code sequence here. Um, we draw a line, and again, you can see how it's mirrored. And again, at the front of the top part, we're adding zeros. and the front of the bottom part, we're adding ones. This is now our three-bit gray code sequence. You can write that up, mirror it, zeros and ones, and that's your four-bit gray code sequence. And you just repeat that as many times as you need it. Um, so... Tomorrow, we'll basically get into the k-mapping stuff. Um, I'll go over a review of that. The k-maps will be something that you'll definitely want to practice a lot if you're not comfortable with them. Um, on the exam, we obviously end up using these quite a bit, even if it, the question is not directly k-map this, but you saw with the state machines, there's a lot of k-map. With the counters, there's a lot of k-mapping. Um, so it's, it is worth becoming quite proficient in these.